Hi, Miss Nikki here. Welcome to Chapter 9. We're going to talk about muscles, and we're going to talk about muscle physiology. So there are four phases of muscle action that we're going to discuss in great detail. We're going to talk about ions moving. We're going to talk about resting membrane potentials and action potentials. And you'll need to know all of the steps and the details for four phases of muscle action. As we move through this PowerPoint, I will have some study tips for you. So there'll be a, a slide that shows you how to do flow charts. So just to take the main ideas out. Once you have the main ideas down, you can go back and add detail and come up with a more detailed answer that would be acceptable for a test answer. So this is difficult. You cannot skip this section if you don't understand it. This is the foundation for all muscle contraction, skeletal, cardiac, and smooth, which will come up in 202, and then also nerve um, conduction, which is going to come up in the next chapter, chapter 11. So it's really, really important. You can't skip it. If you have any questions, please contact me, and let's get started. First, let's start with an overview of muscle tissue. So nearly half of the body's mass is made up of muscle. Remember that we can use muscle to transform chemical energy found in glucose into ATP, and then we use that ATP to direct mechanical energy, or this would be movement. So we're going to look at the types of muscle tissue, we're going to look at the characteristics, and then we're going to look at muscle function. Some terminologies to look for, anything that says myo or mys or sarco, these are all prefixes for muscle. So if you see sarco lemma or lima, you know it has something to do with muscle. There are three types we should know by now, skeletal, cardiac, and smooth. Remember smooth is organs, specifically hollow organs. This is the heart and these are attached to bone. So only skeletal and smooth muscles are elongated and referred to as muscle fibers or muscle fiber cells. So you'll see me sometimes abbreviate muscle fiber cell. It is a cell, but it has long fibers inside, and those fibers are made up of proteins. So the first type of muscle is skeletal muscle. We've already mentioned that it's attached to bones. The point that I want to make sure we remember is that it's controlled by voluntary action. So basically, your brain, via your central nervous system, is going to control the contraction of a skeletal muscle. They fire rapidly, they contract rapidly, they tire easily, but they are very powerful. So the next two types, cardiac and smooth, I want to make sure that we remember they are involuntary. They cannot be controlled consciously. Now, your central nervous system or your brain can cause contraction or relaxation, but you cannot will the muscle to contract. So if I said sit here right now and try to tell your heart to stop beating, you're not going to be able to do that. It's still controlled by your brain, but you don't have conscious control over the action. Here's the table from your textbook, and you can see the skeletal, cardiac, and smooth. I want you to look at the cell shape and appearance. So in skeletal, here are those striations we were talking about, and the fibers can be really long. In cardiac, if you remember, we have those gap junctions that allow cardiac muscles to talk to each other. They still have striations, they're just not as pronounced as they are in skeletal. And then we have smooth muscle, and it's called smooth because of the way that it looks. You do not see striations or lines anymore, and these striations correspond to fibers. So smooth muscle is set up a little bit differently, and at the end of this lecture we'll talk about why. Here are the four special characteristics of muscle. So muscle is excitable. You, muscle can respond to a stimulus. So if your brain sends a message to your muscle, your muscle can respond to that message. And when it does, it usually contracts. So here we have the contractility. When a muscle is stimulated, it usually shortens. Extensibility, muscles can be stretched and then they have elasticity that they can recoil. So most of us, when we think of elastic, we really think of stretching, but elasticity means that once it's been stretched, it will snap back into its original location or form. Now we move on to four important muscle functions. So we're gonna see here, number one, movement of bones and fluid. When you see bones, you should think skeletal. When you see fluid, you should think cardiac and smooth. For maintaining posture and body position, think of all of the muscles of your back that we looked at in chapter 10 and that all of those uh, skeletal muscles help maintain your posture and body position. 
go back to chapter 8 and look at the uh, stabilizing effect that muscle tone has on joints. And then last, heat generation. We saw this all the way back in chapter 1 when we talked about shivering, so contracting skeletal muscles in order to generate heat to keep you warm if you're cold. When we look at skeletal muscle anatomy, we need to look at some of the other features. So remember that there is innervation, so nerve and vascular blood supply. We're also going to look at the connective tissue sheaths that allow the entire muscle to act as a whole. And then we're going to look at some of the attachment that we briefly mentioned already in Chapter 10. Each muscle is going to have a nerve, and that nerve is going to control this voluntary skeletal muscle action. So remember that the brain is going to send a message to tell the muscle to contract. That message, you can think of it as the stimulus. So you have to have the nerve going to the muscle in order for that message to be received. The artery and the vein, arteries are going to drop off oxygen and nutrients, and the veins are going to pick up the waste and the CO2. So this last statement, muscle fibers require huge amounts of oxygen and nutrients. Specifically, they're talking about glucose. So go back to your cellular respiration equation and make sure that this makes sense to you. What do muscles need? They need glucose and oxygen. Why? Because they have to make ATP in order to have mechanical energy or movement. Each skeletal muscle is covered in connective tissue. So we're going to look at the whole muscle and then we're going to break it down into fascicles so entire muscle, fascicles, and then we're going to look at each muscle fiber cell. We're going to look at the connective tissue sheath called epimesium, paramecium, and endomesium. Knowing what you know about prefixes, you should be able to figure out these terms. So this MYS, I told you, has something to do with muscle anytime you see it. And then we should know epi, upon, peri, around, and then our endo inside. This figure from your book is showing you a muscle attached to a bone. You should be able to guess that this is the femur, right? Remember those trochanters? Here's the tendon attaching the muscle to the bone, and the entire muscle is wrapped in epimesium, so this is whole muscle. Within the muscle, we have fascicles. These are bundles of muscle cells, and they're wrapped in paramecium. So now we've pulled out the fascicle, and we're looking at a muscle fiber cell. The muscle fiber cell is wrapped in endomesium. So each of these is a muscle fiber cell wrapped in endomesium. Next, we have attachments. So muscles are attached to bones in two different places. The site of attachment that is movable is called insertion, and the site that is immovable is called origin. We also have direct and indirect attachment. With direct, the epimesium of the muscle fuses with the periosteum of the bone. So if we had our bone here, it would look like the muscle is attaching directly to the bone. With indirect attachment, that's similar to our last picture, where we saw the tendon coming off of the bone, and then the tendon leads to the muscle. That would be a rope-like tendon. That would be indirect attachment. Here's a great table from your book, breaking all of these structures down for you. So here's the whole muscle wrapped in epimesium. Then they pull out a fascicle. The fascicle is wrapped in paramecium. Inside the fascicle are muscle fibers, muscle fiber cells, same thing. The muscle fiber cell is wrapped in endomesium, that's the outer layer here, and then the inner layer is the sarcolemma, and this is the same thing as the plasma membrane. So remember cells have plasma membranes, we're just going to call it the sarcolemma. And then inside the muscle fiber cell, we have individual structures called myofibrils. We're going to look at these in more detail. Now we need to look at the microanatomy of the muscle fiber cell. 
So muscle fiber cells are long. They have many nuclei. They have a sarcolemma, which is the plasma membrane. Some people say sarcolemma. There's the sarcoplasm, which is the cytoplasm. There are glycogen storages. Remember, glycogen is how the body stores glucose. We have oxygen storage, myoglobin, and then we have modified organelles, myofibrils, sarcoplasmic reticulum, and something called T-tubules. So right here, sarco, you should see muscle. This is the same thing as endoplasmic reticulum that we looked at back in chapter three. Let's review before we move forward. So here's the muscle. It's wrapped in epimecium. We're going to pull out a fascicle, which is wrapped in paramecium. Then we have the muscle fiber cell, and it's wrapped in endomecium. And then the very next layer is the sarcolemma, which is the muscle fiber plasma membrane. Inside the muscle fiber cell, you have myofibrils. Here we have the muscle fiber cell. The endomecium is gone. You can see the sarcolemma here. You can see mitochondria, lots of them. Remember, this is the site of cellular respiration or turning the energy and glucose into ATP that we can use for movement. And then we have myofibrils. And you can see there are many myofibrils inside a muscle fiber cell. There could be hundreds to thousands of myofibrils within one muscle fiber cell. Now we need to look inside the myofibrils. So these are densely packed. From the figure we just saw, we can have hundreds to thousands of myofibrils inside one muscle fiber cell. We're going to look at some of the features of myofibrils, the striations or the lines. We're going to look at sarcomeres. We're going to look at myofilaments. And then we're going to look at the molecular composition of these myofilaments. From one of the previous figures, we should have seen the striations or the stripes. I think I referred to them as lines. They have to do with the thick and thin proteins. So these proteins are what actually create those lines, stripes, or striations on the myofibrils. These thick and thin proteins we're actually going to call myofilaments. We'll get to that in just a moment. A sarcomere is the smallest contractile unit of a muscle fiber cell. It's a region between two successive Z discs. Individual sarcomeres align end to end along the myofibril, kind of like boxcars of a train. Here are the great figures from your book that are showing you the striations or the lines. And we can also see a sarcomere. So sarcomere is from Z disc to Z disc and they line up. You have an, one here, you have another one here, you have another one here. We just can't see the Z-discs. This sarcomere from Z-disc to Z-disc is the smallest contractile unit. This area is going to contract and then it's going to relax. So contained within myofibrils are myofilaments. We have thin myofilaments and thick myofilaments. Thick is made up of a protein called myosin, and thin is made up of a protein called actin. Here's another figure that we can use to identify these structures. So Z-disc to Z-disc is the sarcomere. If we look at the myofilaments, we can see the thin. The thin is this blue line here. And then the thick is this red. And you can see the thin is attached to the Z-disc and the thick is attached to something called an elastic myofilament, which then attaches to the Z-disc. Inside the myofibrils, we have thick myofilaments and thin myofilaments. The thick is made up of myosin, and the thin is made up of F-actin and G-actin. So most people think of the F-actin as the string, and the beads on the string are the G-actin. We also have something called tropomyosin and troponin. These are regulatory proteins that are bound to the actin. So this bar-like structure is the tropomyosin, and the yellow structure is the troponin. So the tropomyosin acts as a gate, 
and the troponin acts as a lock over the thin myofilament to prevent unwanted contraction. So here's the more complicated structure from your book that's labeled. I wanted to point out thick, again, is made up of myosin. Thin is made up of the protein actin. And then you have regulatory proteins, tropomyosin and troponin. All of these proteins have to be made by a cell, right? You have to have DNA in order to make a protein. So all of these proteins that are in the myofibrils were made by the muscle fiber cell. We need to mention a few other proteins that help with the structure of the myofibril and with muscle contraction in general. So we have the elastic myofilament. I showed you this protein that holds the thick uh, myofilament in place. So remember that the elastic binds the thick and then the elastic binds the Z disc. The second is something called dystrophin. So this links the thin filament of the protein to the sarcolemma or the plasma membrane of the overall muscle fiber cells. Again, some helpful figures to make these points clear. Here's the elastic myofilament right here in yellow and you can see it attaches the thick myofilament to the Z-disc. The second one, dystrophin, is this protein in red. And you can see the dystrophin attaches the myofilaments inside to the sarcolemma on the outside. Basically, without this dystrophin protein, you can have contraction happening inside the muscle but the entire muscle wouldn't contract. You would just have Z-disc to Z-disc or sarcomere contracting, but it wouldn't spread over the entire muscle fiber cell. Now we need to look at some specialized organelles in the muscle cell. So we saw mitochondria already, but we need to look at the sarcoplasmic reticulum. This is endoplasmic reticulum. It's going to surround each myofibril. And then we're going to have T-tubules, we're going to have a pair of terminal cisternae. And if I take the terminal cisternae and the T-tubule and I put them together, we have a structure called a triad. On to a figure to help us sort out all of these crazy new terms, right? Here's the muscle fiber cell. That's this entire structure. Now we're looking at just a myofibril. There's one here, 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 right? So I'm looking at the myofibrils. I can also identify Z-disc to Z-disc. That's going to be sarcomere. I can see the sarcolemma, which is the plasma membrane. I can see the red line, which is the thick. And I can see the blue line, which is the thin myofilament. All of this blue structure, this is the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It wraps around, and you can see it on the back side, it wraps around every myofibril. A triad is one T-tubule and two terminal cisternae. So if I drew a box in this area, that would be a triad. So the light blue line is the T-tubule. And then next to the light blue line, you have storage tanks, which are the terminal cisternae. Again, this T-tubule we'll see is going to carry the message to the entire muscle fiber cell to tell it to contract. And we'll see that message in just a moment. The other part I want to point out is what other organelles would you find in this cell? Well, we can see our mitochondria, right? We have to have tons of mitochondria because we have to take glucose and we have to turn it into ATP energy. You may not see it in this picture, but what else do you have to have? You have to have a nucleus. Why do you have to have a nucleus? You have to make proteins. What proteins am I talking about? Myosin, titan, F-actin, G-actin, tropomyosin, troponin, they're all made by the muscle fiber cell, and to make proteins, you have to have DNA. The process of contraction or generating force in the muscle fiber cell is sometimes described by this process called the sliding filament model of contraction, sometimes sliding filament theory. So what's going to happen the thin filaments are going to slide past the thick filaments 
but neither of the filaments are going to change in length. They're just going to overlap each other. This slide describes a very broad definition or explanation of sliding filament theory. We're going to go into much more detail. But you can see here it's saying in a relaxed state, the thick and thin myofilaments overlap only slightly. When the nervous system stimulates the muscle, the myosin heads are going to bind to the actin. Remember, myosin was the thick and actin was the thin. During contraction, the myosin heads are going to attach to the actin and detach and bind again, basically propelling the thin myofilament towards the center over the thick filament. When the sarcomere shortens Z disc to Z disc, the muscle cell shortens and the whole muscle shortens. This figure is showing you a fully relaxed sarcomere, so Z disc to Z disc. We can see the thin and the thick. And what I want you to notice is this space here. So this is a fully relaxed sarcomere. Now we see a fully contracted sarcomere, Z disc to Z disc. What happened to this space? In the last figure, relaxed, there was no thin myofilament there in that location. So what has happened, the thin myofilament is overlapped or moved towards the middle. It is covering more of the thick myofilament. Let's review before we move on. So we see myofibril. Remember inside myofibrils we have myofilaments, both thick and thin. We have Z disc to Z disc, which we call a sarcomere. And the sarcomere is the smallest contractile unit. This is where the thin myofilament is going to be pulled over the thick myofilament and cause contraction. So if the myofibril is contracting because the sarcomere is contracting, that can be spread to the entire muscle fiber cell. So now the muscle fiber cell is contracting. If the muscle fiber cell is contracting, the fascicle can contract. And if the fascicle is contracting, the entire muscle can contract. On to muscle fiber contraction. So we need to talk first about the four steps that must occur for skeletal muscle to contract, and then we're going to talk about the four phases. So first here, we have to have nerve stimulation. Remember, skeletal muscle is voluntary, and we're going to have a neuron send a message. That message is going to create something called an action potential. This is really an electrical current difference. It's generated in the plasma membrane of the muscle fiber cell, and we'll talk more about this in just a moment. The action potential must get to the inside. So action potential is created on the plasma membrane or the sarcolemma, and it has to get internally, and it's going to use those T tubules to do so. Then the fourth thing that must happen is we have to have stores of calcium, and it has to be intracellular. The calcium is what's going to bind the troponin and remove the lock. So steps one and two here, these are excitation. How do we turn a nerve signal into an action potential in the muscle? And then steps three and four are excitation contraction coupling. So how do we turn the action potential at the sarcolemma into an internal signal to get ready to contract inside the muscle fiber cell. On to the nerve muscle relationship. So skeletal muscles are stimulated by somatic motor neurons. So they're neurons that are going to cause some sort of action and somatic means body. So we have divisions of the nervous system. There's the somatic motor and these are just neurons that are going to cause skeletal muscle action. We also have autonomic motor neurons, which are going to send messages to cardiac and smooth muscle. So again, just another division, two different divisions, two different sets of neurons, if you will, that control voluntary action like skeletal muscle movement or involuntary action like cardiac and smooth. So where the neuron and the muscle fiber meet is called the neuromuscular junction. 
Each motor neuron and all of the muscle fibers that it innervates is called a motor unit. I have a picture in just a moment. And skeletal muscles must be stimulated by a nerve or the muscle will not contract. So this is paralysis. This figure is from chapter 11. This is showing you a neuron structure. So we can see that there's a body, there are dendrites, there's an axon, and we go down to these axon terminals. This is what's going to form the neuromuscular junction along with the muscle fiber cell. This is a great figure to illustrate motor units. So we can see the neuron cell body. So this is the cell body, this is the axon of the neuron, and we get out to the axon terminals. Remember the axon terminals help form the neuromuscular junction, right? So the motor unit in purple is going to innervate two muscle fiber cells, and then the motor unit in red is going to innervate three or create three neuromuscular junctions. So at the neuromuscular junction, this is where the axon terminal, the end of the axon, is going to come in contact with the muscle fiber. They are not truly touching. They're separated by something called the synaptic cleft. There is a chemical that we need to talk about. It's called a neurotransmitter. It's called acetylcholine. It's going to be stored in the axon terminals. There are also junctional folds in the sarcolemma and those junctional folds have many, many acetylcholine receptors. So the neuromuscular junction consists of the axon terminals, the synaptic cleft, and the junctional folds. So now that we know this terminology, let's label this picture. So this is the axon of the neuron. These are the axon terminals. This is a muscle fiber cell. This is an enlarged axon terminal. This outer layer or lining is the sarcolemma. These are the junctional folds. Here we have the acetylcholine receptors and then inside the vesicles of the axon terminal we have the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. This is the synaptic cleft. So where would we find the neuromuscular junction? It's the axon terminal, the junctional folds, and the synaptic cleft make up the neuromuscular junction. Now that we have some background information, we get to move on to the four phases of muscle action. So you can see them listed here. First one is excitation. This is when we're turning the nerve action potential or message into a muscle action potential or message. Step two or phase two is called excitation contraction coupling. How do we link the membrane or the sarcolemma to deep inside where the thick and the thin myofilaments are located. Those are the ones that are actually going to cause contraction. How do we spread the message from the surface to deep? Three is contraction. That's where the thick myosin is going to reach up and grab the thin. My cute little drawing, right? It's going to reach up and grab and pull the thin over the thick. That's contraction. And then we have relaxation. So all the work is finished, the muscle fiber relaxes and returns to its resting length. Before we talk about each step of muscle action in detail, we need to learn a little bit about a resting membrane potential. So the resting sarcolemma is polarized. This just means opposite. In this case, it means opposite in voltage, so a voltage difference. So if this is my sarcolemma or lemma, I'm saying it's positive on the outside of the muscle fiber cell and it's negative on the inside of the muscle fiber cell. The muscle fiber cell plasma membrane called the sarcolemma is polarized. On the inside, it is a negative 90 millivolts. We call this the resting membrane potential. So RMP is equal to negative 90 millivolts. 
the inside of a muscle fiber cell is negative because of these large negative anions. The inside also has some positive potassiums. They'll become important later in relaxation. On the outside of the muscle fiber cell, we'll see lots of sodium molecules, and that's what makes the outside more positive. Before we actually look at the steps of excitation, let's talk about some of the things that are going to occur. So the first thing is we're going to see an end plate potential created. And that end plate potential is going to convert the neuron signal to the muscle signal, which we have abbreviated here, action potential AP. So remember we said we have to take the neuron message and we have to turn it into a muscle message. Well, the side step or the intermediate step is the EPP. So the neuron message comes in, we create an EPP, end plate potential, and then that creates an action potential, which is a muscle message. We need to talk about these terms depolarization and repolarization. So depolarization is talking about changing the inside of the muscle cell from negative to positive. And then repolarization, which is changing the inside of the muscle cell back to negative. So probably the best way to look at this is to think about what polarization is so I'm going to abbreviate. Polarization, it was positive on the outside, negative on the inside. What happens if you depolarize something? The outside is positive, but the inside is now positive as well. So change the inside of the muscle cell from negative to positive. Then if I'm going to repolarize, I'm going to change the inside of the muscle cell back to negative, back to its original. So basically, this is all that we're doing when we're trying to create an action potential and then the relaxation part that follows. So think of polar as resting. This is what the muscle fiber cell looks at rest. Depolarization, this is what the muscle fiber cell looks like at contraction. And repolarization, what the muscle fiber looks like at relaxation. And you can see steps one and two here are part of excitation Step three would be part of relaxation, but it occurs at the same site where excitation is happening, so they usually talk about both of them. So if you're confused, just hang on. We're going to look at the individual steps of excitation next. Inside Blackboard, I have several videos for you to watch. I have two different videos for excitation, two different videos for excitation contraction coupling, and then two more for contraction. They're from different sites and they show different animations. I think they're all very good. So please make sure that you go to Blackboard and watch those videos repeatedly. So now we have the excitation steps. This looks like a lot of wording. I'm not going to read this to you word for word. We're going to move to the figures and then look at each one of these steps. But you can see there's a number of actions that are occurring. So the nerve signal is going to open a calcium channel, and that's going to cause the axon terminal to release the acetylcholine. The acetylcholine is going to bind the acetylcholine receptor. We're going to have sodium enter the muscle fiber cell and that's going to shift the resting membrane potential to, from negative to positive, and that's going to create that end plate potential we talked about, the intermediate step between the neuron message and the muscle message. If the EPP or end plate potential causes enough change in the membrane, it's going to cause more sodium gates to open, and there's going to be a surge of sodium that floods into the cell, specifically muscle fiber cell, causing an action potential that spreads over the sarlema or the plasma membrane of the muscle fiber cell. Here we have the axon of the neuron. It meets at the neuromuscular junction with the muscle fiber cell. We can see here the word action potential, and remember we're going to use this generally as a term to say sending a message. So the action potential or the message spreads through the neuron, through the axon terminals. That's what they're trying to show you here. So they're saying a message is coming from the brain. It has now reached the axon terminal of the neuron. When the message reaches the axon terminal, it's going to cause calcium gates to open. 
When the calcium gates open, calcium floods into the axon terminal and it causes the acetylcholine to be released from the vesicles into the synaptic cleft. So now the acetylcholine is in the synaptic cleft and it binds the acetylcholine receptor. So these green little spheres, these are acetylcholine. It opens this gate and it allows sodium to come in and potassium to trickle out. Here is an enlarged picture. They don't show you the calcium channels, but remember calcium had to come in in order for acetylcholine to be released into the synaptic cleft. When acetylcholine is released, you can see how it's binding the acetylcholine receptor. It causes this channel to open and you can see sodium is coming in and potassium is trickling out. It's just a little bit of potassium. So if I have a bunch of positive things coming in, I was at negative 90 millivolts. If I add 20 positive sodiums, I'm now going to be at a negative 70. Negative 70 is still more positive than negative 90, right? So this positive from the sodiums coming in creates a wave of depolarization that we call an end gate potential. So it's becoming more positive on the inside. We're starting to depolarize and take the membrane from negative to slightly more positive. If we reach something called the threshold, if we reach a certain number, then this sodium channel is going to open and sodium is going to come pouring in. Tons of positives are going to take the negative 90 millivolts all the way up to positive 30, 35 in some books. This is called the action potential. So let's look at the voltage changes. Here we have negative 90. We said this was the resting membrane potential. This is when the sodium is coming in and the potassium is trickling out. We see kind of a slow change right here. This would be the creation of the end plate potential. Once we reach a certain threshold from these sodiums coming into the muscle fiber cell, that's when the sodium only channels open. And now sodium is pouring inside. So lots of sodium inside the muscle fiber cell. And guess what happens to the negative charge? It goes all the way from negative 90 up to positive 30 millivolts. This is your action potential. This is also depolarization because we've gone from negative to positive on the inside of the muscle fiber cell. We'll eventually talk about this part, which will be repolarization. You're going back to your negative 90 millivolt resting membrane potential. Let's walk through those steps again. So the nerve signal opens a voltage gated calcium channel. When extracellular calcium floods the axon terminal, it stimulates the release of acetylcholine from vesicles into the synaptic cleft. The key point here is that we're at the axon terminal. We're outside of the muscle fiber cell, right? We're not inside the muscle fiber cell yet. So that's why they call it extracellular calcium. It's calcium outside of the cell. So the acetylcholine is released into the synaptic cleft. The acetylcholine molecules bind to the acetylcholine receptor that's on the sarcolemma. This is called a ligand gate because something has to bind and that causes this ion channel to open. So it was that purple picture and we had the acetylcholine bound to it and we showed sodium coming in and we showed potassium trickling out. So this is an ion channel. Ions can move through this channel if and only if acetylcholine binds to the acetylcholine receptor. So sodium enters very quickly, shifting the resting membrane potential from negative to positive while the potassium exits slowly. This local change is called an in-plate potential. If the in-plate potential causes enough change inside the, to the membrane or inside to the voltage, 
it reaches something we call threshold. Once we reach threshold, the nearby voltage-gated sodium-only channels open. A huge surge of sodium floods the cell and produces an action potential. This action potential spreads over the sarcolemma and is basically going to go to the interior or go deep into the muscle fiber cell to cause contraction. We're moving on to phase two. Phase two is called excitation contraction coupling. So we just created an action potential at the sarcolemma. We need to spread that message or lead that message to the myofilaments, the thick and the thin. So the action potential is spread along the sarcolemma. Remember the action potential is really just an electrical charge. It's a positive electrical charge. That moves along the sarcolemma, turning the inside from negative to positive as it moves along the sarcolemma. That message spreads down the T-tubules, opens gates, which are ion channels, and allows calcium to be released from the cisternae into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The calcium is going to bind the troponin and cause the complex, remember those regulatory proteins, troponin and myosin, they're going to change shape and expose the active sites on the actin. First figure here, you can see the action potential that was generated along the sarcolemma. It travels down the positive message travels down the sarcolemma till it gets to the T-tubule. It goes down the T-tubule and causes the terminal cisternae to release calcium. Here is an enlarged view where you can see the sarcolemma. You can see the action potential spreading across the sarcolemma and then down into the T-tubules. Remember the T-tubule and the terminal cisternae are all part of something called the triad, right? So the action potential spreads down, it causes these channels to open, and all of these calcium that we're storing are released into the sarcoplasm. You can see the calcium here, all of the little red spheres, and point to make that this is intracellular. So that's why we had to say that the other calcium was extracellular. There's two different calcium types at work here. Now you can see the thick filament, and you can see the thin filament. We're going to enlarge this area so we can see what's going to happen to the calcium. Here we have the calcium that's been released into the sarcoplasm. The calcium is going to bind the troponin. So we see the troponin here. The troponin is going to be bound by calcium, and that causes the tropomyosin to shift. So the entire gate shifts. Do you see how the site open? We call these active sites. So the active sites are exposed and they're ready for the myosin to bind. So if the tropomyosin, if the gate stays over the active site of the actin or thin myofilament, you cannot have contraction. So the calcium binds the troponin. That causes the tropomyosin gate to shift, and now the active sites are exposed and they're ready for the myosin or thick filament to bind. Before we talk about phase three and four, we need to mention why calcium is so important and in detail. So remember when we talked about bones, we talked about storing calcium in our bones should we need it. We talked about parathyroid hormone. Why is that so important? Because if you have low blood calcium levels, parathyroid breaks down bone and releases the calcium into your bloodstream. And we said the reason this is so important is because calcium is necessary for muscle contraction and nervous cell transmission. So why is calcium important in muscle contraction so far up until now, everything that we've learned? Well, in excitation, the extracellular calcium triggers the release of the acetylcholine from the axon terminal. If you don't have enough extracellular calcium, you can't release acetylcholine. If you can't release acetylcholine, you cannot even start the contraction process. In excitation contraction coupling, we have the intracellular calcium. It has to bind to the troponin and cause that shape change of the troponin tropomyosin complex in order for the active site to be available for contraction. So, so far we need extracellular calcium to release acetylcholine and we need intracellular calcium to bind to the troponin. Without calcium, these actions would not be possible. On to phase three. So this is the third phase, contraction. We call this the cross-bridge cycle. 
So before we look at the actual steps, let's talk about a few things. Revisit the sliding filament theory. Remember the distance between the sarcomeres decrease and sarcomeres between Z disk and Z disk. What's going to happen? The thick myofilament myosin protein is going to bind to the thin myofilament actin active sites. And remember, actin is also a protein. And you're going to have contraction occur. The thin myofilament is going to slide over the thick myofilament. Now we move on to the steps of contraction. The myosin head on the thick myofilament is going to hydrolyze an ATP molecule, break it down, use the energy that was stored in that ATP molecule to activate and cock the myosin head into the extended position. So normally the myosin kind of sits up a little bit. When it gets to the cocked position, it's going to extend. It's almost like doing a bicep curl. Then we're going to move on to two, which is called the cross bridge formation. The myosin head is going to bind the active site on the thin myofilament. Then we have a power stroke occurring. The myosin head releases the ADP and the phosphate. Remember, if you break an ATP molecule, you break it down into ADP plus P, and you get out energy. So the ADP and P is going to be released and it's going to flex and pull the thin myofilament over the thick. The fourth step is the cross bridge detachment. So more ATP has to bind the myosin head, which releases the thin myofilament, and the head extends, attaches to a new active site further down. This is almost like hand over hand if you're pulling a rope. Think of your hands as the myosin or the thick and the rope as the thin. So we stopped about here last time. Remember, this is the calcium. The calcium binds the troponin. It shifts the tropomyosin, and now the active site is exposed. What's going to happen is the myosin cross bridge, the myosin is going to cock into this extended position with the help of ATP, and it's going to be able to bind to the actin. Now we see an enlarged view of what's happening at the thick and thin myofilament. We can see here the ADP and P. So ATP was broken down, we got energy out, and that energy was used to cock the myosin head. We can see that the myosin is bound to the actin at the active site. Now we can see the power stroke at work here. So with the release of ADP and P, the myosin head pulls the thin myofilament over the thick. Now we can see detachment. So remember the ADP and P left the myosin head. Now we have ATP binding again, and that causes the myosin head to be released from the active site of the actin. This cycle of contraction will continue as long as there's ATP and calcium. So as long as these two are present, this cycle will continue. We can see ADP and P they were hydrolyzed from ATP. It allowed the myosin head to form this cocked position. The myosin releases the ADP and P and uses that energy to pull the thin myofilament over the thick. That's called the power stroke. ATP binds to the myosin head again, and that allows for the detachment for the myosin head to be removed from the active site of actin thin myofilament. The ATP is hydrolyzed again. Now the myosin head goes into the cocked position and binds the active site of the actin thin myofilament. We're finally on the fourth phase, relaxation. So restoring the resting membrane potential. Remember we use the word repolarization. So we want to make sure that the outside is positive and the inside is negative again. We're going to restore the resting membrane conditions, which were negative 90 millivolts. The sodium channels are going to close, the potassium channels are going to open, and potassium is going to start leaving. If I was at negative 90 and I added a whole bunch of sodiums and I went up to positive 30, now if I remove a whole bunch of potassiums from the inside, this negative 30 is going to drop back down to negative 90 millivolts. 
there's something called a refractory period. It's a period of time where the muscle fiber cannot be stimulated until the repolarization is complete. So there are some factors that we need to talk about. We need to talk about when is ATP needed, we need to talk about active transport, and we need to talk about the sodium potassium pump. Remember how I said excitation and relaxation kind of occur at the same site even though they're different events. So this is phase one and this is phase four. But we're back to looking at the figure we used for excitation. So here was the open sodium channel. Remember all those sodiums came in? Here was the closed potassium channel. This is during excitation. Look down here at repolarization. This is relaxation. The potassium channel is now open and the sodium channel is now closed. So during excitation, sodium is coming in. During relaxation, potassium is leaving the muscle fiber cell. So let's look again at the voltage. Negative 90, this is the resting membrane potential. This is when the sodium channels open. We call this depolarization or we can refer to this as contraction. The muscle fiber cell inside goes up to positive 30 millivolts. Now the sodium channels close and the potassium channels open. So when the potassium channels open, we have repolarization or relaxation, and the muscle fiber cell returns to its resting membrane potential, which is negative 90 millivolts. Here are the steps of relaxation. The nerve stimulation, the nerve message stops. I no longer want to contract my biceps brachii. There is an enzyme that's going to remove the acetylcholine from the acetylcholine receptors. If you remove the acetylcholine, that is going to stop the action potential in the muscle fiber cell. Remember, acetylcholine allowed for that channel to be open where sodium came in and potassium came out. So we have to close this channel. The sodium only gate closes, but the potassium only gate opens. This is causing the inside of the muscle fiber cell to become more negative again. The resting membrane potential is restored to its original, which was negative 90 millivolts. There's a few more items we have to talk about. Active transport pumps the calcium from the sarcoplasm back into the terminal cisternae. Remember the calcium is bound to the troponin the active sites are available. If we want to stop contraction, we have to put the gate back, which was tropomyosin, and we have to put the lock back, which was troponin. So we have to remove all the calcium and push it back into the terminal cisternae. This is pushing the calcium against its current back into a tank of calcium. So this would be active transport, taking it from a low area to a high area, so you need ATP for this. Then we have the sodium potassium pump. I'm going to go into more detail in another slide. We have to get the players back on the right side of the field. So I'll come back and talk about the sodium potassium pump. We're going to have the troponin and the tropomyosin complex move back over the actin active sites. The muscle fiber is going to return to its original resting length because of those elastic myofilaments. Now we add to the list that very last step. So why is calcium important for muscle contraction? The extracellular calcium triggers the release of acetylcholine. This would be in excitation. In excitation contraction coupling, the intracellular calcium binds the troponin and makes the active site available. In relaxation, we have to pump the calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, specifically the terminal cisternae, so that we can end contraction. Now we get to look at the four ways that ATP is used in muscle contraction. So the myosin cross bridge needs ATP. Remember that has to be hydrolyzed into ADP plus P to start the extension of the myosin head. We also need ATP for the detachment in order to remove the myosin head so that it can bind the thin myofilament again. We also need ATP to pump the calcium back into the terminal cisternae. So we pull the calcium off of the troponin and we pump it back into the terminal cisternae. 
Running the sodium potassium pump, we have put the ions back on the correct side so that we can contract again. So if this is my sarcomere, no, I'm sorry, sarcolemma. Remember we had sodium on the outside and we had potassium on the inside. So what happened during excitation? We had sodium come in. When we generated the action potential, we had sodium come in. And then during relaxation, we had the potassium go out. Well, now we have all these potassiums out here and all of these sodiums in here, and we need to get them back on the correct starting side. So that's where this sodium potassium pump comes into play. So the sodium potassium pump binds the potassiums and binds the sodiums and puts the sodiums on the outside and the potassiums back on the inside and the pump requires ATP. So what is rigor mortis? This is the three to four hours after death, the muscles begin to stiffen. It's because there's no ATP being made. If there's no ATP being made, the cross bridge can't detach. So basically all of the myosin heads are bound to all of the thin myofilaments. The muscles stay in a contracted state until the muscle proteins start to break down. So eventually when the myosin and the actin start degrading and breaking down, then the muscles will not be contracted anymore. I'm sure you're wondering, how do I study for this exam? This is a lot of material, a lot of detailed steps. You need to know all four phases of muscle action and you need to understand them as well so you can answer questions about the four phases. So first I would create a flow chart with simple words and then I would expand on that flow chart once I had masked it and add more information. I'm going to give you some examples and you can use the steps and the wording that I've provided. Here is my sample flow chart for excitation. So there's a signal from the brain. This is your neuron message. It reaches the neuromuscular junction. The end of the message reaches the axon terminal of the neuron. Extracellular calcium enters the terminal, signals the release of acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. Acetylcholine binds the acetylcholine receptor on the sarcolemma of the muscle fiber cell. The sodium rushes in, the potassium slowly out, and we create an end plate potential. That causes a separate sodium voltage gate to open and that causes an action potential in the sarcolemma. These are the detailed steps of excitation. This is exactly the same as the slide steps that I showed you earlier. You can see this example is an acceptable test answer. I've basically just taken the steps and kind of fine tuned it. If I use the term muscle fiber cell and then I put an abbreviation after, then I can use the abbreviation again and you should know what I'm talking about or I should know what you're talking about reading the test answer. Please take this seriously. Um, make sure that you understand all four phases, not just memorizing them, but you understand what's happening because you will not be able to answer the multiple choice test questions if you don't. So take the time, learn the phases, write the flow charts, write the test answers, watch the videos, and ask me questions if you don't understand. This will be a large part of your exam grade. Um, I'm more concerned that you understand the material, but I know to you your grade is important. So if you have any questions, please let me know.